Hello and welcome to another GM Tips. This is GM Rick here. I hope you're doing really good this week. Um, today's GM Tips, I'm going to go a little bit off of the type of terrains and campaigns. I'm going to discuss a little bit more um, commerce, trade, and valuable resources in a campaign. I think so often we're so set on the story of the campaign that we forget to build up the area around our characters. Now, some GMs are really good at that. Um, I'll, I'll give a good, for instance, Wolfgang Bauer and his bunch at Cobalt Press. I could tell that Wolfgang was probably a very interesting GM or DM, depending on which system he was playing in. Uh, back when he started out in the early uh, 70, late 70s, early 80s. And I'm guessing that, you know, in looking at his books, especially as I go through Midgard and the Southlands and some of his other books, one of the things he puts a lot of emphasis on is helping a player and, and a GM to understand the resources in a land or a country, even in certain city-states or in certain parts of the countries. Now, I know Paizo does some of the same. They do some emphasis there um, and, and really building it and fleshing it out. Now, again, I need to get some more Numera, Numenera, Numenera, Numenera. I'm going to lose my mind trying to say that all the time. <laughs> I'm telling you, Monty, you're killing me, killing me with these names. Numenera or Ninth World. Um, but my guess is they probably flesh out some of the details when it comes to the commerce and trade in an area. I know Open Legend RPG does a little bit more to give you the flexibility to figure it out yourself, as does uh, Savage Worlds, Fate, uh, some of the other systems that are out there. Why is it important? Again, doesn't it just distract from the role play? Isn't it extraneous? Does it really matter? Do the players really care? And those are all questions you as a GM and a DM have to answer for yourself. I will say this, though, and, and it's really important to me as I say this. I'll adjust this a little bit so you get a little better viewing angle of me. Uh, I, in my mind, I truly believe understanding what the available resources in an area are to the players is very important. And knowing what the commerce, trade, trade routes, and other things are very important too. Why is that? Because characters and players often like to make money on the side. They want to have something ongoing to build up their resources as a whole. Adventuring and going into dungeons don't, doesn't always equate into resources. In fact, often what it can do is put a party at risk as they try to overload themselves, carrying out all of this quench, or buying up bags of holding, portable holes, and other sundry items, and, and using Ant Hall to try to do these type of things. Or, in the more futuristic settings, using maglevs, using uh, robots, using uh, other types of anti-gravity type floating units to carry the treasure, or... If they're fortunate, it's just a credit system, and it just goes to the credits that they're doing. Uh, but even so, trade and resource is very important. Uh, characters can truly build up a great campaign story for themselves. Every campaign doesn't have to be about going into an area and combat. Every campaign does not have to be uh, just trying to figure out uh, what heist we're going to pull to get more money. Though, don't get me wrong, those things are important. I truly believe they're very important. Um, but one of the things that I look at with them is this. I think it is very key and important to understand you as, as a GM, for you to understand what your region that you're having your players explore is about. Trade drives an empire. Resources drive what the empire's ambitions are, or, or a kingdom, or a city-state, or a planetary system, planet, system lord, system empire. These are all driven by resources. Let's face it, if you cannot support your empire, if you cannot support your area, how then do you create items and technology or magic items or other resources that are so invaluable for things to be made with. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. One of the trade exports of Osirian in the Mummy's Mask 
is papyrus. And in fact, they even go into, one of the, uh, the creators goes into and spends a good couple pages in the Gazetteer about one of the cities that is built on papyrus. Papyrus, let's face it, without having something to write your words on, write your spells on, write your history on, write your literature on, write your other uh, magical tomes and aids on, how do you then store that information? How do you transfer it? And a lot of times we don't think about that. We just go, ta-da, it's here. And I think we take a lot of the fun out of it. I truly believe that. So, if you know that papyrus trade is very invaluable out of a region, then you know that other things coming in is very valuable to them. And in order for you to get valuable resources for somewhere else and make money, so maybe you do a trade consortium with your players or a trade caravan where they're going city to city, knowing what that next empire and city needs is important because it lets you command the prices. It lets you set where you're going to sell your valuables to the area you're going into in order to make more resources for yourself as players. And again, I, I love that one time my players decided that they were in an area, they took over a bathhouse, and they turned out the bathhouse to being their information center. They took it over from the evil proprietor and then took proprietorship. And they forged the paperwork and made everything look legitimate that they were the owners of this new, you know, uh, bathhouse or this existing bathhouse. They were the new ownership. And it makes a huge difference because then that can become the place where you gain valuable information. So the players may be getting the resources to build a tavern and they have an NPC run the tavern for them. But that becomes the throughput of information that's invaluable to the players, especially when they're looking for information resources. Or doing a Quarks, let's, let's take a Deep Space Nine reference, and, and doing a Quarks bar on a space station. What do you think Quark did? He used his bar to move black market and legitimate goods and gain information. He was an information broker. And that's invaluable in some games. Being that information broker, what's the one key thing Think about it, Mr. in this GM, or or think about it, Lady GM. When when you think about for your players, what is the number one thing they often lack? Information. They are always in search of more information on whatever project, quest, or driving matter that's in their life. So having a way to gain information and add to their roles and make it better for them. So, for instance, we always say, boy, what if they blow that one epic role to learn about something? Well, gee, if they have a bar working in the area near where they're at, they don't just get the one role to try to convince someone. They've got other third parties working for them, getting them that information, and then they pay that third party quite, quite well to run that bar and get that information. And maybe they're a very charismatic individual where the player character is not. Or even if they are, it doubles the chances of gaining the information. I think it's really crucial. And I think present those options to your players. That's number one of the things I think we as GMs and DMs are remiss. I think as, as a lady and, and gentleman GMs, we are very remiss in the fact that we forget what is important. And that is, give them the ability to propel themselves. Give them the ability to sign up their own people to a mission uh, to gain information or gain more, more uh, buying power, clout, to gain the resources they need to have an impact in that quest they're trying to solve. Especially if they're in one area and that quest revolves around an area. So let's let's take, for instance, out of Pathfinder in a very famous one, Rise of the Ruin Lords. In Sandpoint, how invaluable would it be if they opened shop there and slowly build their reputation going out on quests, but they hire people from the town to become the person that's the proprietor of their local endeavor? 
they hired them on as a night manager, a day manager, um, a barkeep, a barmaid, a, a chef. Think about how invaluable that is and how much information trades, ta trades at a table. Especially when you have waiters going around and waitresses, how many of those will gain tidbits of information that's invaluable? It becomes an information resource. And as that becomes the place to go, then more people will come in and share that information. Or it's the place to shop and get those valuable resources that they couldn't get otherwise, or trade crafts. So maybe one of your players is a master craftsman and they teach that trade to other smiths on their downtime. So they take, you know, a lot of campaigns aren't rushed and, and you can have that downtime. So you're creating those master items that you want to use in the party, but then you train someone that eventually does that for you. And oh, by the way, also trades and information as well as resources. Lots of things that go on with that. I had a successful party that in, I don't know if you guys remember, the Shackled City from the old Dungeons and Dragons that Paizo first did. It was their first big adventure path in a book type of thing. I still have it. I ran my players, and one of the things the guy did there was had his own lock company that built locks and keys for all the people in the town. Why was that invaluable? Because then if he found out somebody was a baddie or somebody he needed to check into, guess who had the master key? To all the locks. Did I dissuade him? No, not at all. That was such a creative way, and each time he gained more ability and training in being a locksmith and a master disabler of locks and traps. It was invaluable that his dwarf rogue did these things, and he kind of built his own little guild. And he brought in more resources and brought more trade to the region. And then he opened up a base of operations for the organization that had hired him to go find and stop what was going on in the area. So now you have a ground base. Very different way to role play a path. Because the path wasn't designed for that. But that's okay. This is the players at work. And if you're prepared for these things, you don't go, well, you can't do that. Well, that's not in the books. Well, that's not this. You're already prepared. In fact, it may come to a point to where it's really key for you to utilize such things to really gain a, a foothold. And it makes for some great role play. So give them options. Show them around the town. Drop subtle hints. But don't force them. Just let them know the option is available. And when they broach wanting to do something, if they have the resources and the wherewithal, and they build up that uh, notoriety in the area of doing good things, give them the abilities. Give them some discounts. Don't go crazy, but just give them that ability to find alternate routes to solve things. We always say we want it to be about role play, but then we dissuade role play that's not having to do with the main quest. But yet this does have to do with the main quest. It's an alternate route of taking players that they normally wouldn't do. And by the way, for you as a GM, it prevents burnout. Because now they're coming up with all these cool ideas that can become reality, that help with the plot. And it dissuades the idea that, okay, if I miss that one thing, then I'm going to have to go way around to get back to it again. No. You've already set your ducks in a row. So if that fails, that's okay. We've got this business here. We've got this network here. We've got this thing going here. Now all of a sudden, it becomes creative again. So that's by knowing about what are the resources. So for instance, say they go to a jungle. And they're in that jungle area. And they're part of the settling party that settles it. But the settlers are kind of standoffish to them. Well, the party wants to invest in, in maybe managing a plantation for a plantation owner. So they go out there and manage the system of how crops are picked, maybe how well the said labor is treated. Maybe they're treated more liberally under them. Maybe they're freed from indenturedness. Maybe there's easier ways. And then you buy the loyalty of the plantation hands. 
So all of a sudden, in this area, this party becomes innovative. And, and this, this plantation owner who normally would resist such ideas goes, wow, they've upped the efficiency and made my, my place so profitable and, and made the workers happy. Then maybe I need to employ them and move them up. And eventually, maybe they buy out the plantation under him or her and allow them to go up to a investor role. So now they make money off of not just that plantation, but the next one and the next one. And each party member has a hand in that. And then the party members eventually hire people like them from the, from the, uh, the hands who worked it to become that next layer. So then they can go out and adventure again. But now they've built something new and they are very valuable to that community and they've helped to grow things. You see where I'm going with this? Could be on a ship with sailing. Maybe they become the navigators that plot a new route for the, the ship to go that wouldn't have been there before. Maybe they come up with innovative ideas that keep the captain from killing people as a pirate and maybe allows them to recruit more pirates or privateers onto their bunch. See, there's all kinds of plots and things you can do that will help advance the story in a side way. And then these are the side adventures that don't take way off the rails of where you want to go with the main plot. They just provide a nice distraction for the players to utilize some of their skills and abilities and interaction, and, and, and it forms kind of an interesting, fun side road that doesn't take too far off. Because sometimes those side adventures take them up too many levels or take them way off the beaten track. Well, doing something like this still increases their influence and, and abilities without necessarily driving them up levels upon levels. But you can give them little bonuses to their skills, like a plus two because they've been working this for so long. And so it doesn't really get them uber powerful, but it promotes them wanting to do stuff like this. And again, we've got to think of the creative ideas, especially as you go into these type of things. Of how do we do this? How do we accomplish this? Because we always want to go down the path. And don't get me wrong. I love that there are some people that run adventure paths from Paizo straight through or from other uh, authors like uh, Wizards of the Coast or from Numenera. I love that they want to do that and stay to the, how should I say, stay to the true writer's purpose of that. But that gets old after a while. And after a while, you get out of the campaign mode. So I'm about, and that's why I stay fresh in my ideas, doing it this way, where you allow your players, maybe you make up a guild or, or something that hires them, that then takes them into the purpose of the adventure in the first place. And that becomes that side story that you can let the players somewhat control and not go too far off the beaten track. And so keep that in mind. Not every session has to be kill, kill, smash, smash. And not every player wants to do that. And especially when you get them intrigued into the resources, the politics, what's going on. So five things that I say you've got to flesh out in an area if you're going to do this. And it goes with this. Number one, what are the resources that are available? Number two, is it a resource that has to then go through some sort of industry to be turned into a finished good? Or is the finished good already part of things from what comes out of there? Number three, where are their resources light? Where is there a depletion or where are their needs as a colony um, or a city or an area? What is needed to be brought in? Is it a service? Is it a good? Is it something else? Who is their competition, number four? Who is their friendly competitors and their villainous competitors? Because that can make some real fun, too. Number five, who are the influential entities in that area that the players must interact and either denounce or gain a foothold with and get good favor with for boons and banes? Ooh, how do you like that one, Open Legend? Boons and Banes. Um, and how do you like that one, Paizo? Boons and Banes. And I bet Numenera has Boons and Banes too. So it's that concept of Boons and Banes that we're going to use there. What are the Boons and Banes? So as I go into these type of things with you, take a look at that because those are important. 
flesh out a campaign sheet. It's kind of one of the things I did the GM tip, tips with on Steel Empire about recently. Um, you have to utilize the resources. Do uh, character sheets or do NPC sheets do with their with their goals and other things um, and, and keep that in, in your mind. Write up enough of those and you can use them later on and incorporate them into this type of thing. Do a settlement sheet that, that details a settlement and what, what is the strengths there, what are the weaknesses, what are the resources available, what can the players buy, what can't they get, what could they capitalize if they were the ones that created it. Hmm. Interesting idea, huh? What's something that they could open? Is it a mine? Is it a lumber resource? Is it maybe a lumber with replenishment because they have a druid in the party that can regrow and replant things? And keep the area happy and harmonious. Let's see where I'm going with this? Fun ideas. Especially for those of you who are environmentally fun, friendly as players. There are ways of doing this that put in your personal goals and life in these things. So there's a lot you can do. But you, the GM, the DM, really set that tone. And you have to write it up yourself and be knowledgeable. That's why this work is so important. So many of you... You know, go, oh my gosh, why do I got to do it? Now you see why. It becomes that critical part of use in your adventures. And and please let me know if you use this and where it's been successful. I love those kind of stories because it becomes a repository for everyone else. So when I post it up on Facebook and Twitter, do me a favor. Feedback, feedback, and also on the channel, the YouTube channel, feedback of where you have done this and been successful. Put in the ideas. Let's make a huge chain that people can go down. And, and becomes that creative repository. Um, yes, Simon, I'm sorry I stole that from you. Simon Munoz, I stole the creative repository. I will trademark it for him. He put the creative repository, so I give him the credit. Um, but that's what we need to have, and it becomes a real resource for everyone. Thanks again. I hope this was a fun one for you. I had fun thinking this one through because it gave me some ideas that I want to use in my current adventure. With the guys. So I hope everybody's having a great week. I hope this is really good and I hope you utilize this. Again, Rick M with a capital R, capital T, or capital M, capital T, and the, and then a capital GM on uh, Twitter. Add me if you'd like, comment, send me messages. It's all good and uh, I really appreciate your time.